Welcome to Chicago Founder Story here at 1871, Chicago's digital startup hub, where we interview some of the great founders around the country and hear the stories behind their famous story. Tonight we have the founder of Siri originally, Doug Kitlas, who uh, founded Siri, sold it to Apple. Uh, he's the first one coming back for what we call a second act. His second act was called Viv Labs, and he's going to tell us the story, a little bit of Siri tonight, but also the story of uh, Viv Labs, which he sold recently to Samsung. Doug, welcome. Thank you. Uh, great to have you here. So not everybody uh, has seen the uh, Siri story, which is a great one. Of course, everyone knows it. Uh, my nine-year-old son has a couple of questions, by the way, he asked me to ask you at the end, um, <laughs> starting with Siri's sense of humor and where that comes from. But uh, Doug, you were a, a Chicagoan. You're a Midwesterner. Um, a lot of people don't know that, and a lot of people don't know how Siri came about. Um, share with the audience, if you would, and, and with our viewers, um, you know, where were you before Siri started and, and where that came out? Yeah, so um, I worked in Motorola for five years. And uh, at the latter portion of those five years, I was doing a project with Stanford Research Institute, uh, working on a few things. And uh, one of the other projects I was working on was building the first Android phone with Andy Rubin. Uh, Motorola was sort of at the forefront of that. And in the end, they decided to canceled that project because they didn't want to be dependent on Google for software, which I thought was a really bad idea. Uh, but we had, were, we were a year into that project. And so eventually, uh, I, I asked them what other s platform I should build these advanced smartphones on. And they said, figure it out. And I said, good luck. Good luck with that. So they ended up uh, obviously not, not doing that well after that. But um, so what, what year do you leave Motorola? So that was uh, 2007, and, and actually the day that I decided that I was leaving there, I just so happened to be having dinner with the CEO of, of Stanford Research, and I was this, explaining this to him. This is what's known as SRI? SRI, yeah. So um, I was talking to them, and I was sort of frustrated at this point, and told them that I would help them advance this project, but that uh, I was going to be leaving the company. And they said, well, what are you doing? What are you doing next? And I said, oh, I was you know, entertaining a few options. And they said, well, why don't you come out and be an entrepreneur in residence at SRI? So I thought a lot about that and eventually decided to do that. So a lot of people may not know SRI spun out of Stanford, but and it may be a famous name. But what do they do there? Help people understand, like, what were you, yeah. what, what was the world? You were going from the Motorola world, which has gotten a lot of publicity. And, and talk a little bit about the world you, you moved into, what that Right. Like. So Stanford Research Institute, or SRI, is a primarily government-funded. DARPA is one of their big clients. Um, they do research of all sorts. That's really, really advanced stuff. Nanotech, artificial intelligence, um, all sorts of things, energy. And uh, they have about 2,000 researchers in there, um, some of the smartest people in the world. But what researchers generally don't have as a primary skill is how to apply what their research is. So they bring in people like me, and I talk to them and find out what types of research they have and what, what technology they have, figure out how to apply that in the real world. So the best case scenario is, in my case, they gave me a six-month contract, and I looked through some things. and ended up finding um, Adam Chire and some of the artificial intelligence uh, stuff that they were doing, and we ended up spinning it out and getting funding and building what prototypes. What was it called back then, and what did it do at the time when it was in? So we called it HAL. HAL, like HAL. the movie? Yes, that was the first HAL name. HAL 9000? Yeah, we really, we really wanted to build HAL, only the non-murderous version. Um, Those of you so, who don't know, that was a movie called 2001 A Space yes, Odyssey, yes. which obviously didn't happen in 2001, but yeah, it was, yeah. shows you what people thought of the future actually, I think back it was in the, the 50s, in the 50s. And actually, Hollywood inspires almost, you know, not all, but much of today's technology that actually is out there. First started as some idea that a science fiction writer had. So, yeah, so SRI does that, and we spun that out as a startup in beginning of 2008, and... Or the rest is history on that. So, talk a little bit about uh, you know how you got funded. Um, what was that original team like? Who, who were a part of it? Yeah, so we had the benefit of having um, two really smart and fairly well-known guys at, in the AI field, Adam Chire and Tom Gruber, 
And Adam ran a project called Kalo, which was a government funded, actually the largest AI project in history. It was a $200 million project with 45 universities. And some of the technology that came out of that project was essentially the kernel for what we used at Siri. We had to rebuild all of it, um, but you know, having that sort of credibility and background was very helpful. And then they had, uh, there was a guy named Norman Winarski there who uh, ran the ventures, and he, he kind of you know, was the key behind getting this whole thing started. How did you get the funding? So basically, Norman had a pr program, that this entrepreneur in residence program, and I really didn't know anything about venture funding at the time. I knew everything about the idea, and I'd spent hundreds of hours coming up with this idea with, uh, with Adam uh, and some, uh, some other folks sitting in my lazy boy chair in Mundelein, Illinois, uh, literally just sitting there not far from here. And uh, we built prototypes, and we demonstrated. And, and conceptually, the hard part was differentiating this from search. So funding against Go trying to compete against Google was very hard to do at that time. And I really wasn't interested in building a better search engine. Siri was supposed to be the thing that comes after search engines. That's more personal. That's more conversational. So we demonstrated that. And you know, I was sort of trained by Norman in the whole VC thing. And he had contacts in the VC world. And um, you know, some, other, some other people connected us. And eventually, because we had the heritage that we had, uh, we could show a working prototype. And the vision was something that people were understanding. Um, Funding did, wasn't that difficult for the Series A. Series B was a different story. That was 2009. So you can imagine that. So talk for a minute, if you would, about um, the uh, story of launching Siri. You're famous for your uh, launches, um, even before you met Steve. Um, talk a little bit about how you did that and why you did it that way and what you learned from doing it. So the pre-Apple? Yes. Well. Um, or how you got visibility on it? Before Apple. Before Apple. We didn't have a whole lot of visibility on it. Um, how did Steve learn about what you were doing? So, yeah, that, that's an interesting story. So, um, I launched it in February of 2010. And we, we actually had demoed this. We, we were talking about doing some distribution deals with some various companies. And we actually had a meeting with Apple. Uh, where we demoed it, and it was easily the worst demo that ever that we ever did in the history of the company. Like the speech recognition, we were using a partner, and they they were having a bad day. So I'm asking it literally. I've got a table full of Apple people, and I'm asking it, you know, get me two tickets to the Cubs game, and the speech recognition is coming back saying like the circus is going to be in town next week, like <laughs> completely different. It, it was just some bug in their in the speech. And after a little while, we're just like, guys, we're, you know, we're sorry. And we got back to the office, and we're like, that was a bummer. So, we, so somebody said, well, why don't we build a video of it working and how, what it really does? So we put together, by the end of that same day, we built a video that showed exactly what it was. We sent it right back to Apple. And suddenly, they, you know, their interest was peaked. But nothing really happened at that point, because we hadn't launched it yet. Um, we launched it on the App Store. Um, like I said, in February that year. And apparently, about three different people had, had heard about it and tried it and came up to uh, and told, ran to Steve and said, you got to see this. And uh, then he called me up just out of the blue. I was walking out of the office, and my biz dev guy came up and said, um, Apple's trying to reach you. Now, they don't have your phone number. And Scott Forstall wants to talk to you. And Scott Forstall at the time was the head of software. Because Steve doesn't telegraph that he's about to call anybody. So basically, they wanted to know if I was available. I said, sure. And then my phone rang, and it said Cupertino. So I knew it was, I thought it was Scott. And I couldn't get it to answer, by the way. I don't know if you remember that. You guys remember, you know, when you swipe it, and it keeps going back? <laughs> Steve is calling, and it took like seven swipes before I finally, <laughs> so finally I pick it up. And he said, is this Dag? And I said, yeah. And he said, this is Steve Jobs. And I, and I was like. I looked at the guy next to me, and I go, Steve Jobs. And he goes, <laughs> anyway, long story short, he said, you know, we love what you're doing, and can you come over to my house tomorrow? <laughs> so he was serious about it. And 
Apparently, this is an area that he was very interested in. And the way he described it to us was, when I saw what you guys did, I knew you cracked it. So, and he knew about, you know, he, he had a history with SRI. So, you know, he, uh, he felt comfortable about the technology. But yeah, once he got interested, obviously things were, you know, moved pretty so quick. talk about the process of uh, selling a company to, uh, to Steve Jobs. Well, interestingly, um, every interaction I had with them in that process was one-on-one -on -one with Steve. So he personally took this on. Um, he called me, I think, like 37 days in a row. Um, the first, you know, we, we, we kind of had a quick discussion and you know, realized that we were, you know, of course we're interested and we, we had a great conversation at his house. And, um, but we weren't ready to sell. We just raised a bunch of money. Our, our investors and us thought it was a billion dollar company and we just weren't quite ready. We weren't prepared at that point. Uh, so we, and we talked a little bit about price and I told him what I wanted and he screamed at me, are you out of your mind? So we, we just, we couldn't agree after that first phone call and he said kind of good luck, good luck. And so, you know, we, we hung up and I mean, we just went around about our business and you know, like a week and a half later, you know, he, I got an email, can you talk tonight? And then from, from that point, he, you know, there's a lot of good stories on the negotiation, Pat. I don't know if I can tell them all, but um, <laughs> you guys want to hear some of them? Okay. So, well, let me give you an example. So, well, I'll tell you how it ended. So, one of the things, so our investors did not want to sell. And the founders did not want to sell, but at a certain point, price point, we started to get interested. Um, we were all in our 40s, all of us. We hadn't made some big hit before. It was, you know, it got really interesting at a certain point. And of course, he had convinced us that he wants to make our baby into a worldwide phenomenon and all this, which is an attractive thing. Any founder that does something, especially the technical people, want to see their baby go big. So that was very attractive. And he convinced us that he would do that. Um, but of course, at some point, the founder said, yeah, we want to do it. The board says, mm, we're not really behind this at this point. And Steve's, you know, every day he's calling me up, sometimes at midnight, you know, just, hey, uh, I'll meet with him tomorrow. And, you know, and pretty soon we're like, I'm like, Steve, we want to do it, but the, but the board doesn't. The minute I said that, he switched. He, he became sort of, it was sort of an adversarial negotiation. So now he's my, my advisor, he's my buddy. So he's like, no, Doug, I've, I've been in your place in three different companies. You've got way more power on your board than you think you do. And you know, here's how to approach it, and here's, how, here's what you need to say. And so he, he turned into my advisor, but um, eventually we said, you know, and of course, I was on like the 17th phone call before we got to a price that I would take to the board. Now they knew he was, I was talking to him. But there was a lot of pressure there because, and then of course at the minute that we really are having this discussion, the board was like, well, Steve Jobs doesn't call anybody every day, so keep going, <laughs> keep going on that price. <laughs> Got him on the hook. Oh, and, um, and, so, and of course, then it became this thing. It was, it was very stressful for me because I was a first time CEO. And I'm on the phone with Steve Jobs every day and, he's, and I'm saying, Steve, give me something to bring to the board. He says, okay, raise it another 10 million. And then I go back to the board and they'd say, well, that's really good work for 24 hours. Let's see what you can do in 48. <laughs> uh, so this went on and he started to get, you know. So anyway, we, eventually, you know, 11th hour, we're getting ready to do the deal. And one of my board members, um, Gary Morgenthaler, came up with a brilliant idea because we were, we were ready to go. He said, why don't you have them Actually, I don't know if I can even tell you this, the, the details of this, because um, it's probably confidential. But there was a term that was asked for in this that was a little bit unreasonable. But it didn't change the price, but it changed how much money transacted. So you guys can figure that out if you're in this game. But so, of course, I, I called Steve the next morning. We had the big board meeting where we said, if he takes these terms, we'll do it. So I called him up, and I said, Steve, I have some potentially good news. And he's like, what? And I said, we will take your deal. We'll sign this morning. But you know, here's the following terms that we have to have. He's like, OK, what are they? Of course, I, the one, the, the really serious one, I buried to like the fourth out of the five or whatever. 
So I'm like, yeah, it's all cash, and, you know, and no escrow, and some of these things that are pretty. And he's like, yeah, 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 whatever. And then I said the one, and he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Did you say what I think you just said? I said, yeah. He said, no, 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 no. That's just some bullshit way VCs use to make more money. <laughs> and I said, Steve, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. But if you, if you take that term, we'll sign today. And he goes silent for about five seconds, and he goes, OK. But when you get here, you guys better work your asses off. <laughs> Sorry, all the profanity here, but this is <laughs> this is you know. powder stage. Man. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, so that was, um, and there's other funny stories in there too. But so, talk a little bit about uh, working for Steve, because you had the unique experience of uh, getting to see him on the way to the launch, and and then the launch and the like. Talk yeah, about that. Yeah. Well, experience. one of the fun parts about it was that um, I asked him if he would come and announce it to the team with me, uh, and he said, "Yeah, he would." And how many people on the team at the time? Uh, 22, so 22 people. So he, he drove with Scott over, you know, to to our office. We had to work with their he didn't PR have team. License plates on his car. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, he never had license plates. Apparently, if you're Steve Jobs, you don't need license yeah, plates. no, that's that was his. You know, he would park in handicapped spots. <laughs> he was just kind of above the law, according to him. So those stories are true. Um, but he came in, and and of course. We didn't want anyone to see him coming into our building because then it would, there would be a press event. Like, what is he doing here? Who's he visiting? Is there something happening? That's just the way it works out there. So you know, he pulls up, and we, m myself and my co-founder Adam, he's like holding the elevator open, and I'm like, you know, he gets out of the car. I'm like going to whisk him in because the deal hadn't closed yet, and you just don't want to get into that kind of stuff. Well, he gets out of the car and he starts, "Hey, Dad, how are you doing?" And, we, he, he, and he sits on his on the front of his car, and we just start talking. I'm like. That's great. That's great. Can you come inside? You know, let's, I'm trying to pull him in the door. And we get in the elevator, and we're going up. And I said, this must be the fun part of your job, you know, kind of doing this kind of stuff and with startups. And he looked at Scott, and he looked at him and like, we've never done this before. And he never did it again. And so I had my team up there. And interestingly, their PR people told us that um, when he comes, everyone ha everyone's phone has to be essentially confiscated, so that while he was in the room, nobody could be tweeting that he's there and all this kind of stuff. So somebody was upstairs asking everyone to leave their phones on their tables and come into this all-glass conference room. You don't think they're getting fired? <laughs> they, no, they didn't know what was up. Yeah, right. And then I walked in with Steve, and everyone's like, and you know, you'd think he'd be there for 15 minutes and welcome and this kind of thing, but he was, you know, so we went through this 20-minute Q&A, and he was just, you know, great about everything, and you know, everyone cheered when we announced it, but. And I said, well, I, I know you guys are busy, and thanks. He's like, no, 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 no. No, I know you guys have more questions. And like Scott's like, we have an earnings call. And he's like, I don't care. He's like, I know you guys have more questions. So he, he stayed there for an hour wow. and just went through every question that came up. And there was only one guy that got that bummed out about the fact that he was there. And it was a guy that had spent a year and a half working on the BlackBerry client. <laughs> <laughs> no. So anyway, uh, yeah, so that was crazy. and. Uh, and then we got to Apple the first day, and literally the first day that um, Adam, my co-founder, and I went to the Apple cafeteria, he was just walking by in the, in the cafeteria. Of course, everybody is like, hey, Steve, Steve. And he just kind of walks, and he says, hey, hey, kind of head down. And he walked right by me, and I said, hey, Steve, how you doing? And he kind of went, oh, and he kind of looked, and he saw my Siri lanyard. And he, he perked up, and he goes, the Siri guys. He goes, come here, come here, come here. He put his arms around us, and he said, I want you guys to look around. Look around this place. It was literally the very first time we'd ever been there. Look around this place. He said, no, no, look, look, look. And so we're looking around, and like 500 people are all watching this in the cafeteria. He's like, I want you guys to make this place your personal candy store. You can take whatever you need from this place. We're going to build something great. It was just a neat, uh, a neat welcome to, to Apple for, for us. And, of course, we were, you know, we got a lot of attention from finance and everybody around, you know, the money we were spending. But he, everyone knew it was it was Steve's project. So, yeah, it was an interesting experience. So, how much did you see him after between that and the launch of Siri for in the Apple? So every week or every other week we met. Um, there's there's a little room in Apple that's kind of where all the thing all the decisions get made, and and um, if you're in that room. 
you know, you're at the very core of it. Um, so we met every week or two, and all the way up until the time that he and what died. were those meetings like? Interesting. Some interesting stories. Um, he, so one of, the, one of the, the principles of actually being in that room, if you got to be in that room, he said, you can argue with me. You can tell me I'm wrong. You can tell me I'm an idiot. Um, and you can defend any idea you have. You just better be right. And, and, and you know, if, if you had a few bad calls, then you basically weren't invited back. So it was a lot of pressure in there, but um, really good discussions. And you know, all the focus in there was, was around product and nitty gritty details like what, you know, in the settings of this, should this be the, you know, are these one of the primary ones or should that be second level and, you know, a few other things. And one of the most interesting stories that I remember, one of the few times that I personally witnessed the wrath when, when things didn't go well, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to even use the language, but one of the designers was advocating that Siri didn't re really need to use the chat bubbles. He said, well, we think you should even be more direct and just talk to your phone, and it, it just does what you say. And I said, well, that's great, except what happens when it does something, it gets it wrong. You don't know. We spent a lot of time on you know, understanding that when you say something, you has to, we have what, what's called intent reflection. You have to, the machine has to tell you and show you that it understood what you said and then what it's intended to do about it, and that was the purpose of that interface. And so Steve's just listening to us, you know, just head down, back and forth, and finally he looks up at the, at, at the guy that, was, that I was arguing with. I happened to be on the right side of this one. He said, I agree with Doc. He said, and, and he looked at the other guy, and he said, you guys have been picking this thing up since the minute they walked in the door. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to, for the next three weeks, I want you to follow Doc around. I want you to learn what he learned, see what he sees, see what he sees. You know, come back here and show me. You know, using their approach, you know, you know, six iterations of it, and so he was he was iterative. He would make decisions, and then he would then you would come back, and they would show new ideas, and slowly you'd get to a really polished product. What did you learn about uh, demoing and unveiling and and the like from? Because that's a big part of your advice. Last time you were here is the importance of a great demo was one of your big takeaways. Yeah. What did you learn from Steve and from your time at Apple and Siri about that? So my thing is about inspiring. Not just the demo, but the story has to inspire. You can't do small things because people aren't inspired by small things in general. doesn't mean you can't have a successful company that does that, but that's my big, big lesson, and that to this day um, is the most important thing. And at, at the early stage, you have to inspire investors to get involved, I employees, founders, partners. They have to believe in what you're doing. So you really have to get good at that. Um, Steve's, um, the lessons I learned from him were about focus, about the, and just the, the presentation style that he had was, everything had, it was just boiled down to the very essence so that everyone could understand what the essence of his message was. And you never see a slide that Apple has that has a bunch of words on it, ever, right? Unless it's like, here's all the great things that this feature can do. But in general, he's very clear about the way he communicates things. He's not afraid to be a little provocative. You know, you can tell his style is a little bit, uh, you know, it's engaging, but it's, it's yeah, it's, prov it's pr provocative. And, just watching Apple, you know, I, I knew that when, when Siri was, would come out, and if, I, I wished it was him that would have been the guy on stage to actually unveil this to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but he actually died the day after uh, that it was launched. But we, we did get word that he saw it, and he was really happy about it. Uh, but Apple is just amazing at, at inspiring, changing industries and, you know, their focus on all that. So one thing before we leave Steve, which is he was famous for driving a car with no license plate. Uh, besides the above the law thing, did he just not like the aesthetic of having a license plate and up the lines of the vehicle? <laughs> yeah, he tore the logos off the car. It was all. Did he really? No, he didn't. No. I'm just kidding. He was very. <laughs> but this license thing is like, it's funny. I mean, yeah. I, I remember driving by his house once, coincidentally, and someone said, oh, it's Steve Jobs' house. Yeah. And I'm like, what's with the car? There's no, there's literally no, it's like, yeah. oh, yeah, if you're Steve Jobs in Palo Alto, you don't need it. Uh, and, and he would, he, he flaunted it. I mean, that was one of his things. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So talk about why you decided to do it again. Um, so last time you were here, you were in stealth. So we didn't yeah. talk that much about it. Right. Um, the basis for Viv was that Siri was a chapter. Actually, before we do it, why don't we just, for people in the audience here, the name Siri and the name Viv, can you yes. talk about the, So Siri we'll is a Norwegian name. I'm, Nor I'm Norwegian. and um, In Norwegian, Siri means beautiful woman that leads you to victory. And it's just a cool name. And I, I always loved it. If my son had been a girl, he would have been named Siri. Um, I just love the name, and I had to kind of sell my co-founders on this because, you know, but eventually everyone bought in, and, and that's the quick story on, on the name. Um, Viv, on the other hand, I always liked that too because when back in the Siri days when we were looking at names, I saw that the Viv URL was one that was available. I just loved the symmetry of it, and the name Viv, you know, it's short for Vivian, but it also means life in several languages. And the, the ability to use technology like speak, you know, AI and speech and the conversational interface um, was, you know, the name brings and invokes breathing life into the inanimate objects of your life through conversation. Got it. So that was so, the name. So you've left Siri, you were uh, through, uh, left Apple, and uh, you're talking about why you, why you decided to do this. What? What, what possessed you and, and some of the people you'd worked with before? Yeah, so um, several of us had left Apple uh, six months or a year um, after we left Apple. We were just talking about the future. And what we really boiled down to uh, in that discussion was Siri was, we believed, at chapter one in a much bigger, more important story. And there was a really important missing element to that entire thing, and that's the ability to have an open system. So Viv was built and is built to allow hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people to teach in artificial intelligence simultaneously. So it's like an app, the App Store was to Apple products. So this is sort of the App Store of AI. And that is much, much harder to do. To have you know every AI, every other AI system there is, gets a bunch of data, and they work on it and optimize it and debug it and train it, and then they then they launch it and it's sort of this static thing. We need to have something where people are teaching it new things simultaneously and dynamically, and that is a really really hard thing. It's I mean we've been working on that now for five years, and it's still not ready. And I have one of the best teams in the world, right? I mean, a bunch of the Siri people are there. How big is your team now? Uh, my team now is about 65, in, in, but there's really hundreds of people in Samsung also working on this. So it'll be thousands soon. Um, so, so how was it different to do it the second time? You've been a CEO. You've been a founder. You've built a household product name. You've worked with Steve Jobs. You're on the... You know, list of influential people in Silicon Valley. You got all like a totally different deal than when you left Motorola. Yeah, like, what yeah, am I doing next? Yeah. So, there were easy parts and hard parts. The easy parts were we had a legacy and a heritage that was easy to point to, easy to raise money. Uh, people were, would re return my calls. Um, we also had the luxury of you know picking an area that remained hot. So AI was, you know, it was still. So the first two years, actually, there wasn't a lot going on. But then all of a sudden, everything happened at once. Um, and we can get back to that, that, that topic if you want. But um, so that part was really easy, raising the money. And you know, it, we, we had investors that wanted to throw money at us. It was a hot area. We had credibility. Um, and then on the partnership front, you know, when I was talking to companies, I was talking to the CEOs. And we were really talking about big things. So that part was easier, clearly. Any investor, I mean, if you, if you make an investor money, for some odd reason, they want to keep coming back. And I haven't figured out why that is. But, um, and, and of course, the, the space was hot. Um, the second time around, we, we bid off something that was harder technically than we had anticipated. And it took us, I mean, years and years. And we, we told our investors up front, um, we know exactly what we want to do. It's going to take years. We don't really need to 
do a lot of board meetings and whatever, and I'm, I'm probably going to piss off every VC in the room, but I think we had two board, two board meetings in four years, official board meetings. So basically, we just needed money and time to figure this out. And my job was to get, you know, attract all the best people. You know, we, we, we didn't stray in our vision. Uh, that was also a Siri thing. We never, we decided originally and we didn't pivot. We just stuck with it. And yeah, we knew that was going to be a, a long road. But uh, um, so you, you had an interesting PR strategy to sort of keep you in the, to sort of build awareness and, and in some ways, you know, build awareness for the company. A, a much more glamorous version of what we did with Opening Acts, um, which is uh, Stephen Levy. Um, I want to talk about who Stephen Levy is yeah. and, and how this all came about. So um, one of the lessons that I learned in the first launch was before our big product launch, um, I did 40 uh, press um, interviews, TechCrunch and VentureBeat and all these guys, uh, Tribune, Cranes and locally. Tiger Beat, all of them. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it was an interesting area. Yeah, and, you got, and, you got and, huge and publicity. It was we, great. We, we got big pub publicity, but the story that was told was sort of different from everyone's mouth, right? So I, I, I felt like I always told the same, same story, but the story that would go out would be different. Mm -hmm. So what we decided in the Viv world was where we were going to find the best technology journalists uh, that we could and then to have them come and only do one interview and do a deep interview and... Uh, and, and really have one story come out the other end and really spend a lot of time and effort on it. And our first choice was Stephen Levy from Wired because he's, you know, he's the first guy that ever interviewed Steve on the, about the Mac. He's a legend. And didn't he, what, what, he wrote a couple of books, didn't he? Yeah, he wrote, yeah, he wrote many books, kind of the book on Google and, and others. He's writing a Facebook book right now that's sort of chapter two. But he, he's a legend. And we basically offered, it was either him or John Markoff from the New York Times. And Stephen Levy actually tells, if you go to the Y Combinator startup school, Stephen Levy tells the story of a one PR strategy and, and tells this story yeah. of basically being embedded with you yeah. for six months. He was embedded with us for six months, back and forth all the time, did a really in-depth stuff on the technology, the future, the vision, all of the people involved, and just came out with this seminal piece that would have been the cover of Wired that, uh, that month, which would have been really cool had um, Snowden not come in at, like a week before and gave them an exclusive interview. So if you see the Snowden thing, you'll know that's the one that's, uh, that's got the Viv article. But the impact that what happened when that came out was pretty amazing. Um, that went live on the Wired site at 5 a.m. Pacific time. And by 7 a.m., we, we had an email from a senior VP at Google wanting to meet with us with his entire team that day. So Google, and like it, you know, it was an interesting area and team. They came in really quickly and then... Um, Talk about that experience. We, there's, I'd like to go through now, because you were working on something that was pre-launch, mm -hmm. but also became even more strategic to all these big companies. Um, to the extent you can, talk about the experiences and what that's like and, and what, you know... Which part? We'll start with Google. Yeah. So, you, so the Google people, you know, before breakfast, you're, uh, you've got a meeting set up with Google for the day to talk about how this might plug into their world and for them to get a feel for it. Talk about what that meeting was like and, and where that led and what. So there's a guy named Alan Eustace who um, had a prior relationship with Adam, my co-founder. And he's an interesting guy. I don't know if you guys remember Alan Eustace is also the guy who has the world record for jumping out of the, uh, took and taking a balloon into space and jumping and having the highest altitude free fall. He beat the Red Bull guy. I don't know if you remember that, but same guy, crazy, crazy, but a really, really great guy. But um, we knew Google. Google doesn't generally partner, so we knew that that was sort of, you know, an acquisition type of discussion. But you know, you dance around that for a while. And you go to meet with, you know, we met with sort of top people. Actually, I, I didn't meet Larry, but, um, you know, the head of search and you know, John Gianendra and, and uh, all, all those guys, they all know that this is a big part of the future. In fact, if you look at what happened after Siri, now every one of the top six or seven 
tech companies in the world is putting billions of dollars into their version of that. Mm -hmm. um, so they all see that trend. Um, I, there wasn't anything really notable about that until later, um, which is, you know, they did some things that weren't so uh, attractive to us, but um, maybe we can get into that. But soon after Google got interested, um, I had let my investor know that I wanted to talk to Mark Zuckerberg because they were also getting into it. And so I ended up meeting with him quickly after that, and he was, they were very excited and inter interested. And what's, what's, he, what's he like? You know, I was expecting kind of a less of a nice guy. I mean, he's just such a nice guy, and he's so intelligent and ambitious, but he's a clear communicator. Um, you know, when, when he was pitching us, he said, you know, AI is going to be one of our top three priorities. You know, we're, we're doing these walks around the campus because he likes to do these walks. And, you know, we want you guys to be at the center of this. And he pointed over to this building that you could see off in the distance that was under construction. And he said, we have 7,000 people in this company and over a billion users. And that building over there holds 24,000 people. And we don't know who they're going to be yet. We just know we're going after it. Um, and he proceeded to walk me through their revenue plan to assure me that in the five years it was going to take us to really get our thing going, they were still going to be relevant. <laughs> but it was, I mean, it was brilliant. I mean, he, he just is on top of it. And the, probably the most ambitious guy I've ever met. And I liked him a lot. Uh, I liked the team. We were going to work probably in the messenger team. But in the end, um, you know, we were only nine people. We were just over a year old. Um, you know, we got nine-figure offers, which is really, really good. But we just weren't ready. We, you know, it, it, you don't put your cards on the table that quickly. And did he we invest like, personally? Yeah, so um, after we turned them down, both of them, um, his, uh, his venture arm of his family office reached out and ended up investing. And so he you know, personally had, he was one of the biggest investors in the company after that. Talk for a minute about the, um, that investor, because it's an interesting model. And um, yeah. it's a funny one, because we had a dinner. We have had a dinner for the people who've been on the show here uh, once a year. And we, uh, so the first guy to come in was Doc Donner. Anytime I'm serving good wine, Doc is always the first one there <laughs> and the last one to leave. And we have a great time. But Doc comes in, and he's like, I got to tell you, I just raised money. And I'm not out yet. I just wanted to let you know this. So we're talking, and then a couple of the people come in, and I go to greet the next people who come. Next guy comes in. A uh, few people after that, when he's over, Doug's over talking to some people. He's, he's a guy named Andrew Sage, who's been on this from Kira, Terrific founder, great, great guy. And I'm talking to Andrew, and he's like, I got to tell you, I just raised money. And I'm like, oh, what a small world. Well, each of them had told me who it was. It was the same yeah. investor the same week had invested yeah. in both of them. Yeah. And it's an investor I'd never heard of, but is actually really well-known, but a bit off the radar if you're not in that. So talk a little bit about Iconic and what they are. And yeah, Iconic's got a really interesting model. Um, it's run by a guy named Devesh, who's a super connected guy in the Valley and ev everywhere, pretty much, who runs R Mark's family office. But they've subsequently branched out. But their model, which was so interesting, was they kind of said, well, you know, I, the, the implication was Mark is sort of interested, keeping an eye on you guys, wants to invest. Um, but we also have a bunch of you know, A-listers that are a part of our organization. And, and so they don't generally take board seats. They, they give good valuations. They're really hands off. But they're, they can open the door to any of the top. I mean, I, I can't tell you the list of the people. But pretty, if you can think of a billionaire that's, that's a CEO of one of the top companies in Silicon Valley, they're going to be able to connect you to them. And, What's not to like about that? I mean, yeah, you know, good valuations, hands off, and just access to anyone you want. And you know, they they keep they keep this distance between you know the investors and and what that so there's not any real conflict of interest there. But yeah, it's it's an interesting model. And I've told other VCs, you guys got to keep an eye on these guys because it's pretty hard to say no when they come calling. So, talk a little about um, other people you met. Some, you met some really interesting. Um, kind of legendary people in the valley there. Talk about those experiences and what that was. Yeah, so, I mean, we're, we were fortunate to have been, you know, like I, I mentioned earlier that 
Uh, for the first two years of Viv, there, really it was just Siri. There wasn't really much else going on, but suddenly it exploded like nothing I've ever seen. Um, and, you know, the Echo came out and uh, Google Assistant came out. Cortana was coming out from Microsoft. Um, everyone was getting in this game. And a lot of people saw that we had, had an advantage and had a team that had been proven. And uh, so, you know, my job is to, to position the company for some partnerships. So I talked to everybody. Um, and some of the people that, that we met, so the first meeting I had with Microsoft was Satya Nadella flew over to San Jose and came into our little office, which is kind of cool. And that's not normal, obviously. Uh, great guy, um, neat, good team. Um, and we, so we had some discussions with them and um, met with Jeff Bezos at, at Amazon. And we what actually- it, What was that like? That was interesting because we, we actually were there before, just before the Echo launched and we got a preview of what was coming. We're like, wow, these guys did such an amazing job on the hardware in particular with the far field mics. I don't know if you guys know, like the, the Echo was different than anything before it because they had spent a lot of time uh, with a system where they could hear you across the room. It could, it could hear you on top of music that it was playing itself. Um, it was just a really, really good product that they did, they did well. But Jeff was just, I mean, he's got the loudest laugh. I mean, if you were laughing in this room, you'd like, you have to put your hands over your ears. Just a neat guy, and he was really into the, like, the business model, so we had really interesting business model discussions and demos. So they, you know, we were exploring, you know, kind of exploring things with a lot of companies. I met with Elon Musk because uh, um, actually through one of your good buddies, or one of our YPO buddies, um, and he, he was having a bad day, though. That was not a good meeting. Uh, you know, the, one of his Falcon rockets blew up the next week. I think it was just, it was a bad week for him because we started talking, I was, and I was saying, well, yeah, we, we've got these patents, and he's like, I hate patents. Oh, and yeah, and then we're, I'm, I'm telling him about this, the, the, the V symbol, we think is gonna someday be something like Wi-Fi. He said, I hate symbols. I'm like, okay, this is going well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, right. he's, you know, we, we were, we're gonna talking about doing a deal with having to be the in-car thing for Tesla, and they had done a, just done a deal with Google, but he said, you know, in the end, he said, come back when you're ready and it, we'll see how you compare with them. Uh, so he was an interesting guy, although uh, not in the best of moods that day. Um, he also, um, you, be, you become, got to the entertainment world. Talk about this, this is pretty cool. Yeah, so this is a crazy, I mean, this is not a normal startup story, guys. So um, we, we were approached by Will I Am from Black Eyed Peas. So he came out of the office a few times and he was trying to sell us, because he, I don't know if you guys know, but he, he did his own like um, line of, of wearables and some things and he really wanted some good AI behind it. But he would bring his entourage and uh, he said, you know, we want, we'd really like Viv to be the next member of the Black Eyed Peas. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, if it isn't a person, you know, it's, a, it's an AI and we just, you know, he, he thinks like, like kind of like Madonna, who's always ahead of his time a little bit, like she was always ahead of her time. So that was one of his ideas. And you know, we'll, we'll do this stage stuff, we'll like, we'll, we'll hand off a solo to Viv to play, you know, electronically on stage, we'll be talking to, it was really interesting discussions. Um, but in the end, um, you know, we can only pick one as a startup, you so pick how, one. How'd you pick Samsung? Scale, uh, I mean, we talked to everyone. I mean, Facebook's at scale too. Um, Obviously, I mean, most of them do. People don't fully appreciate Samsung scale. Talk no, about that. Yeah, so that, that blew me away. So we had, Samsung's a big beast, and in general, it's hard to do but as a startup to deal with these types of companies. I think I had like seven different in, um, meeting requests from seven different parts of the company, and I said no to all of them. And we're just like, it's just too much. You know, there's just, you know, you never know if you have a decision maker on the line. But eventually, we, we did meet with, with one. We took a meeting that went really well. And we, you know, this, we just presented our, our vision for the future. And you could have basically taken the logos from one presentation and just switched them, and they would have been the same. Um, but what, you know, our ultimate goal with Viv was ubiquity. Like we want to kind of finish this job. Apple's got, you know, brought Siri to the world, and it's, it's, a, it's a household name, and it started this whole um, paradigm around assistance. But, Samsung has 
they ship about 500 million devices a year. They're number one in smartphones, number one in TVs. In fact, they sell more TVs than the second, third, and fourth combined. They're second in appliances. What was the thing they just about bought how Harman. often something like they sell a device or a TV? Uh, they, they sell multiple. It's like every per, three seconds or yeah, something? Yeah, or, or more. Yeah, I, I don't remember the exact number, but uh, they're, you know. It, it's in, sort of a mind-blowing amount of scale. It's a mind-blowing amount of thing. They had the same vision, and, you know, it, it's hard to get decisions made in such a huge company. But once they move, it, the scale is absolutely unbelievable. And they were showing me an org chart when, it, when we were talking to them. And this guy was explaining, well, this division's um, about two, two times bigger than Microsoft. This division's about the same size as Apple. This division, you know, and, and I was like, whoa, OK. So you know, our, one of their, our goals is ubiquity, just being everywhere. And getting distribution partners, especially at a point, and as a, as a CEO, I have to keep an eye on what's going on in the market. Um, the whole world was doing this already. So Samsung didn't really have a play yet, um, at least one that we didn't, you know, that we knew about. And you know, we just said we have to make some moves here. So, a um, couple questions we ask, and then I'll go to the questions from the audience. Um, so, as you look at, um, is there anything that you did this time that you say, boy? I would do that differently if I ever did this again, or if I were mentoring or on a board of a friend who's doing a startup. You mean as a second time? Yeah, like in this last run, is there anything you go, yeah, you know, I learned something that I would do differently. No. <laughs> well, no regrets? Not That's really. Good. I mean. Anything you'd say you'd always do again, you're like, boy, that, if there's anything I'd always do again, it's this. Yeah, look, we, we felt that we, we followed a similar path. Like we didn't come up with an idea and then change it six months later. Like what we knew what we were doing was hard and it was going to take years. We knew exactly what we wanted to do. We had a vision um, and we, we were going to follow it to the end. And you know, luckily we had investors that were patient and we you know, bought into the idea that there are projects that take years to do when you're talking about serious technology. Um, and you know, entertaining lots of different interesting options. You know, we talked to Comcast, for example, Brian Roberts and I mean, I just did a, a random 20-minute presentation with he, with he and the, the, the CEO of, of NBC, who they own, Steve Burke. And that turned into a four-hour thing. And what I didn't know is they had, do you guys use, anyone use Comcast with the X1 system? You're talking to the remote. It's like the best TV experience there is out there, as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, so they were super interested. And, hmm. um, Interesting. Yeah. So I want to take some questions from the audience, but starting with the uh, nine-year-old Jack Ryan. Okay. Um, he's taking like ten coding classes, so I think I could hire. My guys want to hire him. Actually, is uh, you know the problem is I can't afford him, but he's he he likes Siri. He wants to know. He had two questions, and I promised him. He called me on my way over and said, "Dad, you have to ask him." So his uh, his first question is, um, like, what's the future? Like when he's our age, what's that going to be like? As it pertains to Siri-like? Like, Siri-like things. I mean, to him, so, Siri is sort of, and Alexa are kind of the right. ones that he knows. Those are the ones in his life. Yeah, right. so um, I have a really strong belief that... But if you had a question, what's next and what's it going to be like when he's grown up? Well, uh, very, uh, I think those are the same. Um, it's just a matter of maturing the technology getting a lot more um, capabilities in this. You'll be talking to everything. It's just easier. That's the point. Um, it's much easier to walk in and, and, and talk to your, your you know, tell your washing machine to, to, to start, or talking to your house and locking the doors and all the stuff, the, the, the minor stuff that's going on. But imagine that when you can do that with pretty much everything. And it works 99.5% of the time. So there's these thresholds of quality in my business where Speech recognition, for example, is like really good speech recognition is about 95%, 90 to 95. When you pass 95, it's the, the, the usage of that explodes. Like the quality level gets to a certain you know, level. AI and the conversation is going to be much better. And you know, the answer to the question is you'll be, you'll, you know, one of the most common things you'll do with any piece of electronics is talk to it. 
So good. So he um, he also wanted to know. He thinks Siri is very funny. He wants to know how Siri got to be so funny. Well, the funny story about that is that we didn't think that much about that up until about three months before it launched, and then. Uh, a few of us were in the room, and we kind of said, you know, people are going to ask funny questions with this thing. So we have to start, and we're like, well, and, and that conversation led to, well, who is Siri? You know, what is the persona? What, what? So we, had to, we came up with a whole persona. So Siri is not from Earth. So if you, can, you can actually find questions. If you ask Siri, what's your favorite color? You'll, you'll get an answer that shows that Siri is not of this Earth, but vaguely aware of popular culture and you know, sarcastic, but never getting in the way. So Siri's not getting in the way of you getting something done, but might make a snarky comment about it along the way. So there was a persona that, that went with that that we sort of, you how'd know, you, right at the end. And yeah, then, how'd, how'd that come to be? Like, how'd you yeah. create that? Well, there's one guy in particular, uh, his name's Harry, who's just this hilarious, sarcastic guy. He's still at Apple, and he's running that whole thing. There's now Hollywood writers, you know, I don't know how many, there's a dozen of them or something, that do nothing but write Siri stuff all day. So yeah, so that's and that so that's you know, interesting. You know, interesting. You know, things like beatboxing and all this. Speaking yeah. of, of Hollywood, so you're you're one of the fathers of the commercialization of AI. There are a lot of people who've been researching it and doing it, but you're you're one of the first to really bring it to market broadly. Um, when you look at Hollywood's depiction, um, are there ones you like better that you think are more intriguing and interesting? The uh, how do you feel about the hers and the ex machina and things like that? Well, I think the most likely scenario is Terminator. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I actually had lunch with uh, with the writer of her, um, and that was one of the best one because AI in that context was about what I called solving the loneliness problem. And there's been indications. I don't know if you guys remember like Smarter Child. It's a, it's a long time ago. Yeah, it's like a chat bot that you would talk to and just, just chat with. It, it would just kind of throw back stuff. It wasn't true intelligence, but it made it feel like it was a, a personality. And, and it, was, it was simple, and it was kind of silly. And, but there was like 100 million users. It was crazy. Wow. And this little, you know, and even the, the uh, I'm, I'm blanking out on the name, the, the vacuum cleaner. Dyson? No. no uh, oh, the, uh, uh, Roomba. The Roomba. 70% of owners that buy Roombas name them. There's all these signs that like people, if you, you know, anthropomorphize any sort of device, people start to connect with it. More. That shows you how long it's it took. I met her in 2000, in, in Switzerland in 2000, and she was working on it, the iRobot. Yeah. And, you know, she's like, well, you know, we're working on a, a, you know, a robot to be the vacuum cleaner. Yeah. It took them another seven or eight yeah, years to yeah, get it smart enough yeah. to go to market. Yeah. I mean, it really shows the, the complexity of the problem. Yeah. But people um, identify with things that just give a little bit of humanity off. It's, it's really interesting. That's one thing you'll notice about a lot of this stuff. Just a little bit, even little color schemes or some things that, that show responses. And there's a whole lot of research going on in that area. So you're going to see a lot of that. Interesting. Um, that segues into a great audience question. Elon Musk is worried about the AI apocalypse and is advocating for regulation for the sake of mankind. Do you agree? I've never heard this question And before. should I worry about my Roomba? <laughs> <laughs> never heard that question before. So um, there's a, you know, that's a debate that a lot of people have. And even myself and my team will argue about it. I personally think that it, it, it is actually, it is inevitable that machines will become smarter than us. No one, no, we're not going to be able to stop it. There's a lot of efforts um, to try to, you know, Elon Musk's effort, OpenAI, is about trying to come up with a system that, that gives machines the morals, you know, that align with our own. Um, but I do think it's inevitable. The question is whether it's 50 years from now or 500 years from now. We don't know. I mean, people that, are, that build this stuff are like, no, they, give me a break. If it ever happens, it's going to be so so long from now. Don't worry about it. But then you start seeing things like AlphaGo beating the best Go player in the world, right? Now that's a game. You remember Deep Deep Blue winning in chess over Gary Kasparov? That is brute force. That's brute force, right? So you can you can basically the computer would literally 
just game out every potential move after every other move. But you can't do that in the game of Go. There's, there's so many combinations. There's literally more Go combinations than there are atoms in the universe. What's Talk fascinating about to me number. about the Go thing is if you study how the machine learned, and I just read something superficially about it, but if you study how they learned, there are things that the machine learned that humans, of course, learn much later. And then there are things that the machine learned much later that are sort of an intermediate human would already know. And so there's actually a lot of evidence that shows they're learning differently. Yeah. So this was supposed to happen 10 to 15 years from now, a computer beating Go. Right. So that's what makes me, gives, gives you pause about how quickly things are moving. Um, but even the game that, the, the, the program that beat Lee Sudol, who's one of the best Go players of all time, crushed him. And, and it was making moves in those games. I was watching this. I don't even play the game, but I'm watching the commentator. And he's sitting there, he's, getting, he's like, oh yeah, that was a, such a stupid move. He just, he just turned over a rock in a different part, portion of this game, and you know, I, I can't see anything. And then like slowly, this, uh, the computer played the game like no human ever has. So the, the best human is, is, was, was freaking out. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a game where you only have a certain amount of time, and these are like world-class matches. The, the world champion had to get up and leave for five minutes because he was so flustered by what the computer was doing. He couldn't figure out. He had to get his, his, his game back together. Huh. So he said, I've never seen a human play like this. And now, since then, they have next generation versions that are where the, the machine is only playing the machine instead of studying the historic human games. And the one that's only playing against the other machine is kicking the ass of the one that play, is studying the human games. Hmm. So that has already, just by speeding up and having the computer play itself, that the quality of that has, I mean, that's scary. That is scary. Right? That's, that's not a game where you're programming a set of things and has a, you know, some sort of execution on the end of it. This is pretty open-ended stuff. Hmm. That's, that's a little scary. Fascinating. I'm going to ask the questions. Please upvote them or add them, but I will ask the questions sort of in an order that makes a good segue uh, from the last one. So how close are we to replacing data scientists with AI, and what are the remaining hurdles? Oh, I don't think we're going to replace it. Um, you know, the big thing now is deep learning, and which is a, a subset of machine learning. But even in to the most advanced things that, that are being used by the, the Go players, and you've heard about uh, this DeepMind company that, that Google bought that learned how to play all the Atari games. Um, it, it still hasn't mastered Pac-Man, by the way. But um, the data science, uh, you have to have really good people in there making adjustments into what, what these, the, the, the machine is crunching. So there's actually a skill. It's not like, OK, here's, we're just going to apply this um, d deep learning technique to any problem, and it's going to miraculously figure it out. Data scientists aren't, go aren't going anywhere, and the quality of the data scientists m are, are what makes something work or not. Um, the question about what are some challenges you face when translating, localizing Siri, Vivid, and non-English languages? Um, pretty well-known problem at this point. Um, Every language is different. The Romance languages are quite easy because you, usually you start with English. Um, there are a few. German is hard. There are, when you get into the symbolic languages like Chinese and others, then there's there's different things. But it's called tokenization. There's a there's a it's a very well known uh, set of techniques, and it just takes time and effort. Or you can just use Google Translate, which is getting better and better. Um, so what keeps you living in Chicago is one of the questions versus moving to Silicon Valley where so much of the technology culture resides. Well, I lived in Silicon Valley for the four years that I did Siri, and I just didn't want to raise a family out there. It was, it's, it's, it's great for work, and I love it for that, and I'll always have connections there. But I wanted to, it's very transient. People are coming and going, and uh, I just love Chicago. And uh, the minute I sold Siri, I was secretly building a house here. and. So I moved back. I love it. Um, talk for a minute about um, you know you as a successful founder with a Silicon Valley based team. One of the questions was about building AI in Chicago, but obviously you built it out there, um, even while you've been commuting. Um, talk a little bit, if you would, about um, your 
insights you have, if you were a Chicago-based founder building a company primarily in Chicago um, and didn't have a Siri under your belt, um, how would you think about trying to raise money um, given how so, so much of the capital is based or centered around the Bay Area? So I think Chicago plays second fiddle to no one at this point. Um, the, when I started Siri, there was, there was nothing like 1871. This is only 10 years ago. And in the meantime, you know, this, this entire movement, so Chicago's one of the leaders. I think it's the biggest one in the nation now. But um, there's, there's successful companies coming out of everywhere now. So the Silicon Valley thing is just, a, you got a higher concentration. The culture there is just nothing but being about this. I mean, if you what work- What about getting Silicon Valley investors to come invest in Chicago? Companies? Oh, I think they are. They're interested. I get people asking me, Keep, are, you, are you in Chicago? I hear there's a lot going on there. Can you let me know if you see any interesting things? So you get a few people yeah. coming up afterwards yeah. with that yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, talk, um, I'll, I'll call you first, don't worry. <laughs> um, you say focus and don't pivot. Um, can you share your team's thinking when a pivot may have been a viable option and why you didn't consider that at Viv? Um, I think there is a time for that, but I think you need to consider, I mean, there's this whole thing about, yeah, failure is good and all that, and then some investors are like, oh, well, we really don't like failure. You, do you learn from it? Yeah, of course you do. Um, but that's, you were talking about product market fit. Um, if you clearly have an idea that you launch and it just doesn't go, and you've, you've tried all the levers, if it's pricing or distribution or the angles or applying it to a different business, great, move, move on, do not spend any more time in that. That's for me, if you can't find a product market fit, I think that's, my, my story was different though because we envisioned something that was just so hard to build, but we knew if we could pull it off that there was no question that it was going to be successful. It, it, it made so many different things much easier and it was the next generation so um, but I think there's a time to pivot, but I personally like, and I think it's important in a company to put all of the wood behind the arrow that you really believe in up until a time that you're sure that there's just no chance it's gonna work. And then, you know, and there's lots of stories of people that have done that, and the second one was, I mean, I think Groupon was, right? Groupon was an offshoot of a different idea. And, Very and much others. pivot, big yeah. pivot from the point. Um, one of the questions about you personally, um, some of you know, Doug, um, uh, had uh, cancer form like st actually the same as Steve had, um, and I learned about it because I, I I emailed him to or texted him to see how he was doing and Doug's a funny guy as you can tell and and uh, a good friend and so I texted him and he sent me back a, a, the after photo um, but he was back and he's like it's it's a hell of a way to lose 15 pounds yeah yeah. Um, but you went through something really serious that, that turned out well. It was scary for you and for your family, and, and, and thank God it turned out well. Um, but talk a little bit about how that affected, and one of the questions was about, you know, second chances in life and sort of what's on, how does that shape your perspective and what's on your personal bucket list now? So the long story short on that was uh, a year ago right now, I was, my wife had made a, a, an appointment for me to get what's called an executive health exam, which is it's a regular doctor appointment, but they do a little more scanning and stuff. You, you pay a little bit extra to do it. And I, I didn't have any reason to go to the doctor. Um, I wasn't sick. I had no symptoms or anything, but um, they found a lemon-sized tumor on my pancreas out of nowhere. And, you know, talk about having the wind knocked out of you. Uh, I just got done doing, you know, my fourth straight triathlon. It was in good shape. I, you know, how is this possible? Uh, and it turned out to be um, exactly the same kind of very rare cancer that Steve Jobs had, which is really weird. Um, my surgeon uh, was on Steve's team, which was odd, because he was the guy that was at University of Colorado from Johns Hopkins. And my nurse's name was Siri. So <laughs> all of that stuff was, it was eerie. It was eerie. But um, luckily, uh, we, I had surgery on it. They successfully removed it, all of it, um, including half my pancreas, my spleen, and my gallbladder, um, exactly a year ago right now. And they got it all. So I, that, um, 
I'm, I'm a lucky guy. I had like a 2% survival rate with all of the factors that were there. So um, I'm back to 100% right now, and it, you know, it's all, it all looks good. But thank you. Um, but I'll tell you, it, there's some, it's hard to describe what it's like to not know. Um, I had about a 72 hour period between the time I found out and we had surgery two days later where I didn't know if I was gonna be alive for spring break because we had plans to take the kids somewhere for spring break and I didn't know if I was gonna be alive to whether I would live 50 more years. And the thing that that brought me was you just grab every moment. And I mean, I, you know, every, you know, slow your life down a little bit. You know, don't, don't try to rush through everything. I, I take my best bottle of wine off the top every time I go out to dinner with family or friends. I don't let it sit in my wine cellar. Um, you know, I, we get together, just being, being with friends and family and, and that, and spending the time on things that matter to you is, I mean, it's the same. I, everyone that goes through this will probably tell you the same thing. But, you know, one of the things that I pride myself on is learning from other people. And so I've, I've heard that before, and I, I tried to do that. But when you go through that, um, it only brings it more to the fore. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's my advice is just do not take things for granted. We don't know when our number is up. Um, and just appreciate. You know, be have gratitude about everything, and, and that, that's, that's the one thing that, uh, that really drives home. And I'm, 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 one, I'm, I'm thankful for it, actually. Um, one last question that kind of builds on that. You've got a important you know, uh, personal um, things you want to do and how you want to spend your time and make the most. You've got a professional challenge ahead to still make the most of what you've been creating and, and its impact on the world. But last question from the list, and. Uh, sort of from my own list here to wrap up with is, as you think beyond that, whatever that time period is, and you think about how you want to spend your professional time beyond this, what are the things, and again, it's nothing to do with rushing through this, but as you, as you reflect on like things you'd like to do still professionally, what does that look like from where you're sitting today? Mm, so I have a few things that I'm thinking about, but, um... I love big problems, um, so I'm actually meeting with uh, my surgeon on a regular basis. We're having dinners with them and the, the chancellors of the University of Colorado system talking about how to bring the entrepreneurial system into um, drug research and, and cancer research and other things. Um, so I'm going to get involved with that. I mean, there's just there, there's so many problems. There's never any problems to, to, to go after. I just happen to like big ones. Um, so I will definitely spend time uh, on that, having gone through this and seeing how many, just watching. I mean, I had three other people that I knew in the last year had exactly the same thing I had, and they're all dead right now, every one of them. Um, so we, we got to figure that out. And so I'll be spending time on that. Um, I also want to get into the creative side of things. I've, I've, there, I've, I've, I've always wanted to write a book. I've read a thousand books, um, so I'm writing a novel that's sort of a uh, Siri gone wild uh, type of thing. There's a lot of those kind of things out there, but I've got some new angles on it. I think it'll be interesting. So I'll get into the creative thing. I definitely want get, to get that done at some point in the future. And then you know, I'll, I'll always be involved in one way or another in you know, trying to either solve big problems or help people solve big problems. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you, Doug. Great to have you. Thank you. Thank you.